and everyone can hear me, Sam? Thumbs up? Yes, okay. we can see you and hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, terrific. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, adverse event reporting today. Uh, and this is a, a somewhat dry and difficult topic. It, there's a, um, a lot of subjectivity involved in adverse event reporting, hence the, the cartoon. Try falling down, scraping me, then you can talk to me about pain. Uh, but uh, Will likes giving me, uh, Will, Dr. Moyer likes giving me the dry topic. So we're going to talk about adverse event and safety monitoring in clinical trials. And the objectives are really going to be to talk about the purpose uh, of what we're trying to accomplish with safety monitoring and adverse event reporting, identifying adverse events, reviewing adverse events, how they get coded, and how they get reported. Uh, and we'll try to cover each of these in turn. So the purpose of safety monitoring and adverse event reporting might, might be uh, self-evident, but it's worth a little bit of discussion. Uh, certainly, we want to identify safety concerns in uh, clinical trials. We want to exclude safety problems. Uh, so even if we don't, we want to identify the safety problems that are there, and we want to be able to demonstrate consistently and effectively that safety concerns don't exist as well. So those are not necessarily exactly the same, but they, they go along to, uh, with each other. And then uh, equally important is uh, to contextualize the risk. So we want to be able to identify adverse events, but we also want to be able to put those adverse events in the context of the medical problem that the patients are having. And finally, what we want to do is uh, report adverse events in a way that comply with uh, federal regulations. And I think anyone who's doing clinical trials should mandatorily be required to read these two guidance documents. I mean, there's a million guidance documents out there for clinical trials. You can't read them all, but these are two that really should be read. They're from uh, the OHRP and the FDA. They were new guidance in 2007 and 2009. Uh, and they really um, are unusually well-written guidance documents. They're not too long, which is nice. And they actually make a lot of sense, which is nice, too, because a lot of guidance documents are, are fairly esoteric. These actually are very practical and uh, well-written. And, and they really describe the expectations of federal oversight agencies in about adverse event reporting clinical trials, and they're not what a lot of people tend to think uh, a lot of the time. They're easily found uh, by any kind of web search for those topics. They're, they're readily available on the web. So let's talk about purpose um, a little bit more, because the things that are not completely obvious is that we want to, when we're doing adverse event reporting, separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, we want to see the obvious and we want to see the subtle. So in this case, uh, we want to be able to see both the dog, the, the black obvious problem um, against a, a, a very different background, and the more subtle problems, the things that tend to blend in, and we want to be able to pull those out as well. So the subtle problems like the soldier on the, on the beige background, harder to see but clearly distinct. And then if we can, we'd actually like to get a sense of the relationship between those problems like we get the relationship between the, the dog and the soldier here. We've got several ways of measuring safety. So talking about safety before uh, adverse event reporting, because adverse event reporting is really just one way of looking at safety. So one of the things that sets uh, neurotrials uh, apart from some other areas of medicine are that very often, one of the best measures of safety in neurologic trials is going to be the same thing that is the primary outcome measure uh, for efficacy. So in a sense, safety is always can be interpreted as, as a, a problem representing negative efficacy. Um, so a lot of the, the safety reporting infrastructure for clinical trials was actually developed more out of the cancer world. Uh, where clinical trials really first came into their their structural own. And you know, in cancer, the primary efficacy measure was usually tumor responsiveness um, and and perhaps mortality. But the safety problems were usually very different. The safety problems were toxicity of the chemotherapeutics, which tended to be very toxic. And the chemotherapeutics would often have, Big problems with morbidity that weren't necessarily rep certainly weren't represented in tumor responsiveness and and not even necessarily in mortality. Uh, 
um, but they, they just made people really, really sick. And so there was something very different to measure in terms of safety. In neurologic trials, a lot of times the activity that we're looking for in neurologic interventions operate on the same cells and the same mechanisms as what we're trying to improve. And so a neurologic worsening is very often uh, the way that we would measure uh, a, a safety problem in the neurologic world. So you think of something obvious like uh, TPA, an acute ischemic stroke, uh, the primary efficacy was going to be neurologic outcome at, at three months. And you could think of the safety problem as being hemorrhage, but really hemorrhage wasn't a safety problem in and of itself other than the way that it negatively affected neurologic outcome at three months. And so uh, it's very clear that you can make a point that when you're explaining safety in your trial that, that negative efficacy might be one of the ways that you're going to look at that. Other ways uh, to measure uh, safety that are that are very effective and worth doing in any clinical trial are predefined safety outcomes. Um, and in uh, predefined safety outcomes are going to be things that you either know are potential safety problems with the intervention that you're looking at, or things that you speculate theoretically could be safety problems, and you set them and, and you decide to measure them prospectively. You know what they are. You're going to create an established set of definitions for them that make them very consistently reported uh, throughout the trial. And you're going to build an analysis plan that allows you to specifically look at those outcomes. And you can even do hypothesis testing on those predefined safety outcomes um, in, in a way that's statistically valid and, and isn't uh, markedly impaired by multiplicity effects. And, and so those are going to be things that you predefine, that they're in there, and you're going to follow them carefully. And then you're still left with a large part of your safety monitoring being monitoring of adverse events. Um, and these are going to be everything that everyone reports as being a problem, independent of whether you expected them or not. And we're going to talk about expectedness. And that's because you really don't know for sure what the safety problems are until you do the investigation. And uh, and most of what we're going to be talking about are these monitoring of uh, undefined adverse events. So let's talk a little bit more about the predefined uh, safety outcomes. These are going to be adverse events of special interest. As I said, the ones that are either theoretically uh, related to the intervention that you know or of known uh, potential toxicity uh, from prior investigations. When you choose these, you want to choose them to be very practical. You want them to be things that people are going to care about. They should be uh, uh, endpoints that matter. Um, they should have clinical relevance. They need to be relatively objective. So having a very subjective uh, predefined safety outcome is going to defeat the purpose. Um, you want to make sure that it's something that you can measure with information that you have available. So you could have something that's uh, a safety outcome that's very important, but isn't really something that you can pull out of the data that you're collecting. That would not be something that you want to predefine as one of your safety outcomes. And then you want it to be communicable. And, and by that, I mean something that has a definition that is concise enough and intuitive enough that you don't have to spend a paragraph defining it in your primary paper so that you're uh, the consumers of your trial at the end of the day have to be constantly reminded of some uh, very long, complicated, esoteric definition of your safety outcome. So it should be something that is relatively intuitive with a definition that is specific, but um, something that people aren't going to have to spend a lot of time trying to remember what you meant. So the uh, there's a lot of regulations and guidelines uh, involving adverse event reporting clinical trials. And uh, the, it's somewhat complicated in uh, application because there are lots of different places that use similar but not identical terms that are defined when they're defined in a way that is similar but not identical and, uh, and end up being therefore somewhat confounded and people aren't always clear what you're talking about. So these 
show up in a couple couple of different places. Uh, as I say, they show up in Title 21 in the FDA regulations, and they show up in the uh, one section, which is the section on INDs, and they show up in the section on new drug applications. Uh, so for drugs, they show up in, the, in these two different places, and they're very similar there. They're somewhat different in Section 812, which is the section on devices. And uh, so the devices talk about IDEs and, uh, and uh, 814, which is pre-market approvals, the 501K, which is sort of the equivalent for devices as the new drug application. And again, they, they're, they're discussed here, and they're discussed in a way that is similar but not identical. It's also uh, in FDA guidance documents. Um, and uh, the most useful ones are the ones that I that I guided you to before, and I saw that there's a, a request for the links to those documents, and we'll provide those. Um, but of course, FDA, in addition to having these specific regulations, also has a general uh, regulation that says that we're not specified otherwise. Uh, clinical trials performed under FDA guidance should always be compliant with the International Conference on Harmonization GCP guidelines. And so we're also left with the adverse event reporting that is mentioned in, in the primary um, clinical trial practice uh, guideline for GCP, which is uh, the E6 guideline, as well as a few comments about adverse event reporting in E2A and E9 as well. And then we've got, of course, the, the GCP equivalent for devices, which is the ISO standard, and that also has a description of it. And then finally, the Cancer Institute has its own sets of uh, descriptions that are often referenced with regard to adverse event reporting. So there's a lot of different places. And, uh, and that does lead to some confusion. What's also very interesting in the guidelines is a number of the places that adverse event, uh, that adverse event reporting and adverse event terms are neither defined nor described at all. And so it's very interesting that for example, that 45 CFR 46, the common rule, which is you know the the, the bedrock for clinical trial uh, methodology, certainly outside of FDA regulation, and the common rule doesn't talk about adverse event reporting at all. Um, similarly, uh, 21 CFR 50, so the FDA regulations that talk about H, you know, human subjects protections in general uh, don't refer to adverse event reporting. So adverse event reporting is part of the uh, approval regulations, but not part of the human subjects protection regulations. Um, it's similarly not part of 21 CFR 56, which are the IRB regulations. So you'd think that IRB reporting um, would be part of the federal regulations relating to adverse events, and it's silent on that. There's really nothing about it there. So what we see is, uh, um, and then we have ICH E2B, which is the Clinical Safety Data Management Guideline. And again, there's no mention of adverse event reporting there. So what we have is, is a general set of rules that say that this is what adverse events are, this is how we're going to weigh them in uh, an approval process. And then there's a general statement that they need to be reported to IRBs. So that, that is safety, problem, safety problems need to be reported to IRBs is about all it says. It doesn't talk about adverse events specifically at all. So that's, that's all fascinating and, and furthers the difficulties with interpretations. So that all being said, let's talk about what the regulations and guidelines do say. Um, there are, one of the things that's interesting is that there are synonyms of adverse events throughout all these different documents. And maybe it's not surprising uh, because they're listed in so many places. But the interesting thing is that normally when you see terms like, so there's synonyms of adverse events in the guidelines that say experience, health consequence, occurrence, outcome, and effect. And you think that if you see all these different terms for adverse event appearing in the guidelines, that they would be specifically defined most places in a way that makes them unique or different. In fact, what the guidelines and the guidances in particular say is that for the most part, all of these terms are synonymous. And they don't have distinct differences that we need to know about. Um, so whether it's an adverse event experience, health consequence, outcome, or occurrence, you can use all of those terms to, to relate to what we're talking about here as adverse events. Um, and uh, so we'll go through the first quiz. I, 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 it's actually a tricky quiz because um, this question relates to something I forgot to say 
earlier in the thing, but let's see if people get it right and then we'll talk about it. So Sam's got a poll here that people can vote on. Um, and, uh, and this is sort of a trick question because I did not give you the answer ahead of time like I meant to. So last year when I gave this talk, I did say it ahead of time and everybody got it right. And uh, this time when I just leave it uh, nebulous, what happens? Okay, so I think we'll, we can stop the poll here and and, uh, um, and uh, do I need to do something here to show the poll to people or? Okay. So the 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 correct answer is is uh, C. So I think most people did get the the right question. the The most important trick here was A. So a lot of people feel that FDA guidance suggests that all AEs should be reported expeditiously to the IRB, and that in fact, uh, and that got a lot of votes, even though that is not correct. So one of the things that the guidance, uh, the most recent guidances have made clear, and were one of the most telling points, um, uh, and, and a representation of, of difference, was that the FDA and OHRP uh, have reported that in the past, everybody reporting every AE that ever occurred to people in these huge volumes were, were swamping IRBs and swamping the overview, the oversight agencies um, with uninterpretable data. So that most, uh, that, that what the FDA and OHRP want to see are things that look like safety problems. They want to be able to pull safety signals out of the mess of data. And so the things that need to be reported expeditiously to the IRB, and we'll talk about this later, are things that are unexpected or um, uh, that are related and unexpected and serious. Um, the common rule does not distinguish between adverse events and adverse occurrences. We talked about that, and of course, safety outcomes should always be well predefined, and we did talk a bit about that. So, good. I'm glad people got that, uh, even though I left that first part off. So what is an adverse event? An adverse event is um, any untoward medical occurrence uh, in a subject. And we're going to try to define these uh, as well as we possibly can. So when we, when we see an adverse event, what we would prefer in reporting is a syndrome or a diagnosis. We'd like to know what happened to the patient. And if we understand what happened and have a uh, specific syndrome diagnosis that we can identify, that would be the, the preferable way to report it. If we really don't know uh, what happened, all we know is that identify symptoms, then symptoms can be an um, adverse event as well. Uh, if, you can, uh, if you can put the symptoms into a syndrome or diagnosis, that's the preferable way of reporting it. So if you think about somebody with a, a constellation of symptoms, they've got fever and cough and difficulty breathing and an infiltrate on chest x-ray, those could be four different symptoms that could be reported as adverse events, but that would be less preferable than saying that that's pneumonia and recording a single adverse event of pneumonia. So uh, the problem, of course, becomes when you don't know for sure, and this does require clinical judgment in, in putting these together. If somebody has a fever and a cough, but they don't have a uh, difficulty breathing and they don't have a radiographic finding, you might want to report that just as the symptoms. If you do report it as the symptoms, then you want to report fever as one adverse event and cough as another adverse event because you're not thinking that they can be obviously linked. If you think that they can be linked, then put them on, under pneumonia. Even if you're not sure, you don't have to be sure. It's just like anything else in medicine. That's your, your clinical judgment. Because it's your clinical judgment, this is an area where study coordinators should not be operating autonomously. Study coordinators, of course, do most of the work in our clinical trials. They're going to collect this information uh, for the most part. But this is an area where all too often, I think, study coordinators are uh, not given adequate support by their principal investigators. 
and really these these do require some medical judgment and uh, so, sometimes going out on a limb a little bit uh, in order to report things in the most useful way possible. So I think it's it, this is one of those areas where you do want to encourage study coordinators to review each of these adverse events um, and see if there's a unified diagnosis of, if possible. And then if the symptoms need to be done instead, then they, those need to be separated out. So let's talk a little bit about what are not adverse events. And there are some common misperceptions of things that are easily uh, confused with adverse events and, and continuously, and, and we always deal with this, but with a little bit of uh, reason you can figure out why they're not. So the most uh, confusing ones are things that are outcomes. So there are things that there are adverse events that result in death, surgery, endotracheal intubation, um, hospitalization, a number of things. But those responses to the adverse event are are the outcomes. They're not the adverse event themselves. So the one we argue about the most and people have the hardest time with is death. So um, death is not an adverse event. Death is is the result of an adverse event. You can have uh, a stroke with neurologic worsening and neurologic worsening leads to death and then death is uh, the outcome of neurologic worsening is an adverse event. You can have Stephen Johnson's syndrome um, that gets worse and leads to death and uh, again death would not be the, the out, would not be the adverse event it would be the outcome. Um, the other one that gets confusing are pre-existing conditions. So things, the conditions that the patient had before they enrolled in the trial do not need to be reported as adverse events in the trial. Um, so if somebody has a, uh, again, using stroke as, as an example, if somebody has a stroke, that's what gets them enrolled in the trial, and they still have stroke symptoms or uh, um, symptoms related to their stroke on day two, and new, even if it's a new symptom related to the stroke on day two, but the the syndrome, the diagnosis, is still stroke, those don't need to be reported as adverse events because they're pre-existing conditions, the stroke that got them into the trial in the first place. The exception to that is um, unless there is a uh, unexpected, precipitous, or, or traumatic worsening of the pre-existing condition. And the problem is that none of those are well-defined either, but if somebody has a, a, a traumatic brain injury that gets them enrolled in a clinical trial, and then they have neurologic worsening that is related to their TBI, so it's a pre-existing condition, and especially if that, that neurologic worsening leads to a subsequent death, then that can certainly be a worsening of the pre-existing condition. And so that could still be reported, um, but it's reported as a worsening of the pre-existing condition. Most pre-existing conditions, though, do not need to be reported as adverse events. Another area of, uh, that leads to a lot of adverse event reporting that uh, does not necessarily constitute an adverse event um, are abnormal results of tests if not considered by the investigator to be clinically significant. Um, certainly uh, in medicine in general, and, and I think it's getting worse instead of better, the, the number of lab tests that are ordered on a daily basis on patients that are hospitalized is, is enormous. And there's a huge volume of test results. And just by chance, there's an awful lot of uh, test results that fall just outside of the parameters of normal and the, the normal laboratory values. And they have nothing to do with the drugs. They have nothing to do with the clinical condition. In fact, they have nothing to do with anything. And those do not all need to report it just because they're outside of the normal boundaries uh, of that test lab. Now, the problem is that if you're not going to report them, they need to be, it needs to be documented that you considered it by the investigator and the investigator noted them to be not clinically significant. And in the old days of, of uh, paper charts, uh, it was actually a little bit easier than today with, with modern charts because you just got a big pile of copies of all the lab results during that hospitalization and you would just go through everything that was flagged as being out of the limits and the investigator would just put a little uh, you know, NCS notation, not clinically significant notation by it. Nowadays, because everybody's just looking at the electronic health record directly, um, and there's really no way to do that research annotation in the laboratory values, you still need to come up with some kind of 
uh, workaround to show how, how to do that, but it's still probably better than having to report dozens of unnecessary uh, abnormal test results. But if you can find a way to annotate that in your source documents, uh, there's no reason for those to be reported. Other things that are not adverse events are things that are adverse, but not things that happen to the patient, or things that could have been adverse that happened to the patient but didn't end up being adverse. So other people's problems. So there are sometimes in the clinical trials that the, the trial can cause a problem for somebody else. Um, the, the example from our own experience was in the uh, Rampart study. We studied auto-injectors, and paramedics applied these auto-injectors to people in status. But if you hold, held the auto-injector upside down um, and put your thumb on the end when you weren't supposed to put your thumb on the end, sometimes instead of the needle being pointed to the patient, the needle was pointing outward, and paramedics would put their thumb on it and slap it down and stick the needle into their thumb or through their thumb and uh, either spray the inside of their thumb with the medication or the sealing of the ambulance with the medication. And those were, those were problems, and those were safety problems, but they were not adverse events because they didn't occur to the, the subject. And so those, those were reported as uh, unanticipated problems, but they're not adverse events. Same thing with near misses. So in, in quality improvement within medicine, we are frequently talking about near misses and looking at those as safety concerns. Things where something, you know, but for the uh, um, some safety intervention or our ball mark, uh, full work, there there would have been a problem. Those are also important. If something went wrong in the study that could have caused harm, uh, that become aware of, but it didn't cause harm, those should also be reported. Those are safety problems, but they're not adverse events because they didn't actually cause that a problem for the subject. So. The regulations talk about these different categories. So I just talked about these, these other notions being unanticipated problems. And that's the definition or category for these things that I mentioned at the end that are uh, not adverse events to the patient, but, uh, but were unanticipated problems that caused, other, uh, that caused problems to other people or, or were near misses. And uh, what the guidance makes clear is that there are adverse events that are not unanticipated problems. There are uh, unanticipated problems that are not adverse events, and there, there's the overlap between the two. So for the most part, adverse events that are not unanticipated problems don't require any kind of unanticipated, don't require any kind of um, uh, accelerated reporting. They're not special. They don't need to be reported as uh, unique problems, but all unanticipated problems, whether related to adverse events or not, do need to be reported. So we're going to spend some time talking about properties of an ad adverse event and uh, the aspects that we'll go through are seriousness, expectedness, relatedness, severity, and then treatment resolution and outcome. And we're really going to spend most of our time concentrating on these first three because these are the three that meet the, the um, FDA criteria and, and implicitly the OHRP criteria for accelerated reporting to either the IRB or the federal agency or both. So let's talk about seriousness first. Seriousness is defined as an adverse event that leads that leads to death, um, that is life-threatening, that causes or prolongs hospitalization, that results in disability or congenital anomaly, or that requires an intervention to prevent permanent impairment or damage. So that's going to distinguish between an adverse event and a serious adverse event. And and these are relatively well defined. These essentially something that's going to require um, one of these conditions, and those are pretty easy to see. And we're going to uh, collect more information about these kinds of events than adverse events that are non-serious. Expectedness is uh, a lot more complicated. Um, expected adverse events, for the most part, it, uh, in the guidance and definitions, are those that were anticipated uh, with the study intervention and predefined in the investigator brochure or protocol. So clearly they're uh, the, the, the first most obvious category of expected adverse events are things that are known side effects of the intervention being used. 
So we expect them to happen in the trial. We expect them to happen because of the intervention. And those are clearly need to be predefined and listed in the and 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 that's very clear. Really everything that's a known or expected adverse reaction to the medication um, should be predefined. Additionally, there can be things that you predefine uh, in the guidance that you know are going to happen in this patient population, whether or not they're related to the intervention or not. So there are, there are very common, uh, perhaps serious adverse events that you expect in patients with stroke and traumatic brain injury or whatever your population is. A lot of, a lot of what we do is critically ill patients uh, that have a lot of complications or chronically ill patients that have a lot of complications. And so to the extent that those are predefined in the protocol as being expected, those would also be uh, um, clearly expected. Less clear, <clears throat> but implicit in the guidelines, but not as explicit, is whether things that are expected in the, in the clinical scenario, um, uh, but not predefined in the documentation, are considered expected or not. And it's clearly that the it's clear from the guidance that things that are commonly expected in these patients should not be reported on an expedited basis. And the only question is whether uh, they use the expectedness uh, definition as the thing that gets you to not ex to not report uh, uh, in an expedited manner all of the things that you expect to happen to the patients in general, or whether you use some other uh, component of that regulation, like the relatedness, to do that. But uh, what's clear is that is that things that are uh, common in this patient population uh, are, are not should not be reported as unexpected uh, findings, or at least not unexpected and related findings, and you can get them excluded one way or the other. The the question that becomes difficult to interpret is how much of an expected, if, if something's expected in 5% of these population, is that expected or not? I mean, something that's not, not super common, but is common, and that's left to a judgment call. So unexpected events are, are just the opposite. They're the events that are not anticipated from the intervention of the subject's clinical scenario. Uh, but the caveat to that is, if there are things that are expected, but you start seeing an imbalance between the treatment groups in otherwise expected or anticipated common events at interval analyses, then those things become unexpected. So an expected event that happens to occur with an imbalance between the groups is an unexpected uh, uh, adverse event and still needs expedited reporting at the time that the imbalance is, done, is noticed. So I'll give you a, a sample algorithm. Uh, this is something that we often use in the net. We sort of adapted this for acute trials. This is modified from a uh, algorithm created by the uh, Allergy and Immunology Institute. <clears throat> um, uh, but it's, so it's just as an example. But I think that it's definitely worth having a algorithm <clears throat> in your protocol for determining relatedness because if you just leave this wide open. People tend to always gravitate toward the middle thing. So, so the the old guidance used to be to classify things into not related, unlikely, possibly related, probably related, and definitely related. <clears throat> um, the new guidance has uh, grouped possibly and probably together because if you just give that without any definitions, everybody always chooses possibly um, because it always seems like, gosh, it's always possible. And so, uh, if you leave it. Uh, subjective, then that gets used too often. So what we've done here is, is we talked about uh, creating specific criteria that you can count for each of these and, and uh, you can read through it. Things that are not related should be where the timing's wrong and there's clearly another cause of the disease. Something's unlikely if another cause is possible and it doesn't not something that the intervention is known to cause. And then possibly and probably get put together when they have two or three of the following where the timing is suggestive and there's not a, another likely cause. And there's uh, and it is something that the intervention is known to uh, cause, and it's only definite when all three of these things happen, where the timing suggests that there's no other possible cause, and it is something that the intervention is known to cause. 
um, so uh, severity is is so those were the big three. Those are the three that get you expedited reporting to the FDA. If something gets reported to the FDA if it's serious, unexpected, and possibly or probably related. Severity is is unrelated to seriousness, sort of. So people always get severity and seriousness mixed up. So seriousness is defined by those criteria that we mentioned earlier, those five things. Uh, seriousness is just a marker of the magnitude of the problem, the, the degree of the problem. Uh, so you could have a very severe headache that doesn't cause you to be uh, kept in the hospital any longer, isn't life-threatening, uh, doesn't carry uh, any other risks. So it's so it can be a non-serious headache, but it could still be very severe. On the other hand, most many conditions, when they're severe, because they're severe, they become serious. So there's there's a relate relation between the two, but they're different. The seriousness uh, is most often characterized. It can be done in any number of ways, and as long as you propose a system up front, you can do it however you want. But we typically use the CTCAE um, uh, methodology. This comes out of the Cancer Institute, and it's a common terminology criteria for adverse events. And essentially what it is, it's a, it's a huge book of hundreds of categories of adverse events and, and goes through zero to five and sort of describes under headache what would make a headache very severe. And so you can sort of look up your adverse event or something like it, um, on this list and this guideline, you can get a sense based on the criteria provided for that event whether or not this is a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And not all adverse events can be 4 or 5. So some things that, you know, there are a lot of adverse events that cannot end up in death, so they don't have 5 as a possibility. So it's not like the most severe headache would be, would be death-related. Um, but as you know, I think that that's uh, it's a little. It's not usually used in analysis very often, and uh, it's not uh, related to the reporting criteria. So it's less important to be um, vigilant about the seriousness, um, uh, the severity, the seriousness you need to be vigilant about. Uh, so treatment, resolution, and outcome are all things that are mentioned uh, within the ICH uh, uh, guidelines and GCP guidelines. So it's worth collecting these things. They can be useful uh, in interpreting adverse events, but they don't contain any regulatory importance. And I think they tend to be um, recorded in, in a ways that are hard to use. So I don't spend a lot of time uh, worrying about treatment resolution outcome, but they should be there uh, when you report an adverse event. You need a date of onset and you need a date of resolution, and uh, whether the adverse event was ongoing at the time of uh, closure of resolution. Okay, easy quiz. Which of these cannot be an adverse event? Okay, so people are changing their votes now. I think uh, we're, we're, we're pretty good. So, so this is good. I think I made this as a strong point and, and everybody was uh, tuned in and listening. So the right answer is death because it's uh, an outcome not of an adverse event, not an adverse event itself. Um, vomiting is a chief complaint. It certainly can be an adverse event. If we could find the cause of vomiting, that would be preferable to report. But uh, very often with vomiting, for example, we, we really don't know what the cause is, and so we report the symptom. Motor vehicle crashes uh, are sort of in this category of things that people don't think of as being uh, an adverse event, but certainly can be. And there are times, especially with uh, drugs that cause uh, drowsiness, for example, where the FDA is very interested in the, the rate of uh, motor vehicle crashes. I was uh, recently on an FDA panel where the FDA had actually sent uh, um, the drug company back to do driving tests where they made people take the drug and then uh, go in a driving simulator 
and see how often they, they crash the simulator. Um, so it certainly can be an adverse event. Um, and uh, uh, death is an outcome, and pneumonia can certainly be an adverse event. Uh, sorry, I didn't see the uh, question from uh, Dr. Newman Toker. Um, uh, we can go back. David, I'll, what I'll do is come back to that slide at the end, and we'll go through that since I didn't notice at the time. Sorry about that. Um, so identifying uh, adverse events. So in your safety plan, you want to be very careful about how you're going to collect your adverse events. And that's uh, very important. So you want to know what over what period the events will be collected. And that can be defined ahead of time based on what you think is most important, given the, scenario, the, the parameters of your, um, of your study. It's uh, very common, for example, to say that uh, you're going to you know, collect events, uh, maybe adverse events, for a uh, limited amount of time at the uh, approximate to the uh, delivery of the intervention. And you might look at, at serious adverse events for a longer time, maybe all the way through the duration of uh, study participant uh, participation in the study until the participant's end of study. So that would be very common. You don't want to, especially in patients that are uh, very ill, either acutely or chronically, be collecting all the unrelated, um, non-serious events that occur uh, throughout three months of, of a complicated course. Um, in addition to some, uh, defining the period uh, over which you will collect the events, though, you need to define when you're going to look for those events. So uh, you could imagine that if you've got an inpatient trial and that the patient was enrolled at the time of admission, you might say that you know, you're going to collect adverse events for a week and you're going to collect serious adverse events for three months. During that first week that you're collecting adverse events, you need to define when you're going to look for those adverse events. So you're going to look for those adverse events uh, um, when you round on the patients daily during that first week, or you're just going to do uh, one chart review uh, at the end of the one week period, but you need to define when it is in your safety plan that you're going to look for those adverse events because that'll determine how quickly you'll find them and how, you, how quickly you'll be able to report them if they're reportable. Uh, and then you're going to have to define where you're going to look for the adverse events. Is this you know, something that you're going to go and uh, interview the subject each time? Is it sometimes subject interview and sometimes talking to the study team or the clinical team? Is it sometimes talking to the subject, talking to the study team, and reviewing the medical record? Is sometimes it might just be a review of the medical record. Sometimes it might just be talking to the subject. So what the data sources are needs to be part of the, the safety plan as well. Um, so naming of adverse events, uh, I sort of mentioned earlier that the names of adverse events are very important. Most of our coding for adverse events, the system comes from looking at the name. And so to the uh, extent possible, you need to have uh, meaningful and disambiguated event names. So a bad event name would be something like hemorrhage. So hemorrhage doesn't tell you what kind of problem the patient is having. You don't know whether the hemorrhage is intracranial or GI or uh, epistaxis or vaginal bleeding or anything else. And so you know you don't know what organ system that belongs to. You don't know how serious it is. There's lots of things you don't know about uh, um, something that's poorly named like that. Um, <clears throat> then there's uh, and and now for serious adverse events, of course, we're going to have information that's beyond the name of the event. For the adverse events, for the non-serious adverse events, the name is the only thing we're going to have to go on for for coding, classifying, and understanding the adverse events. So the name is obviously critically important there, but it's critically important for the serious adverse events too, when we're going to have more information in a narrative. But the narratives are not supposed to be used for categorization of the, the adverse events, and, and typically aren't. So let's talk about the narratives, though, because narrative writing for adverse events is, I think, uh, um, a subtle art that needs to be learned. And it's something that we spend far too little time teaching people how to do or improving their skills and providing feedback on. 
Um, narratives are generally uh, written by coordinators who have various levels of expertise in, in clinical medicine. And so they really are another area where the principal investigator really should be participating in that process and, and often isn't. Um, a narrative description should be not overwhelmingly long. It should be uh, uh, brief so that it can be easily incorporated and uh, quickly reviewed, but it needs to have enough information to be able to make the determinations that we need to make. So it's enough, but not too much. It's sort of like uh, teaching residents to do clinical presentations to you when they present in the clinic, when they present a patient. You know, there are the people who just drone on and give you every possible detail, and that's too much. And there's the people who don't tell you what you need to know, and that's a big problem, too. And um, it's something we really should spend more time, especially if you're going to be working with the same people over and over again, training people to, to do good narratives. Um, I think templates are underutilized, and templates for common adverse events are a good way to train people to do that, where you, where you sort of uh, prompt people for the key data that you want on uh, pneumonias, neurologic worsening, um, things that you expect to happen fairly often in the, in the trial. So what else do you need to remind people in reporting their adverse events? Uh, you need to remind people that a lot of people are going to have to review these things. So uh, you want to encourage people not to create messes that are going to be a pain in the ass for the rest of us to, to deal with um, in the review process. So in this cartoon, he says, I have to create a few loose ends for other people to clear up, then I can get out of here. Um, a lot of people are going to review uh, the, uh, the adverse event, and we have reporting deadlines that that has to take place in. So, so we really need to always be encouraging people to turn in adverse events early and with as much uh, detail as possible. So uh, what we recommend for reviewing adverse events is that they get reviewed internally within the trial first. And usually we have uh, um, a project manager or site coordinator uh, review them for administrative errors, for things that necessary piece of information that need to be there, or uh, things that can't be um, that are that are you know logic checks. Um, we want to make sure that they're complete enough for a clinical reviewer to look at, and that there's enough consistency in reporting between sites so that we're presenting similar type of events in a similar sort of way uh, to the medical reviewers so that the medical reviewer isn't getting inadvertently biased by ways of reporting. So if one site is reporting uh, uh, opacities in the chest x-ray as atelectasis and others are reporting it as nonspecific benign infiltrate, um, we try to reconcile those uh, descriptions in the internal review process ahead of time. And then most trials uh, benefit from having then a, a independent review or adjudication process. It's usually good to have a uh, medical safety monitor who is uh, usually, um, unlike the DSMB, they're, they're actually on the study budget. They're, they're someone who's working for the study, but they're otherwise uninvolved with the project. They've got no role in the trial other than doing these independent reviews. So this is something that shouldn't be done by one of the principal investigators by one of the members <clears throat> of the study leadership. And, the, and then you're going to want to have a plan ahead of time that says what exactly are you going to have these independent reviewers looking for. And the, the brief answer is that it's usually to determine seriousness, relatedness, and uh, um, expectedness, because those are the criteria that lead to expedited FDA reporting. Um, uh, and usually are the same for, for uh, uh, expedited IRB reporting. So, the, um, but but you can certainly assign them more complicated and additional things to review if, if needed as well. Uh, you need to define the, the source material that you're going to provide them. Uh, generally, the, that the best thing to do is just have them work with the uh, narrative that's in the adver uh, serious adverse events. Um, that's going to be within the database. It's going to be contained. It's it's easy to uh, obtain, easy to relate. When that's and, and it should be sufficient enough to, to make these de determinations. Uh, you certainly can 
do something more elaborate, like create chart abstracts if something, things are really complicated, but creating an abstract of the medical record to send to the safety reviewer uh, does increase the workload tremendously for both the sites and the reviewer. And uh, if the narrative summary was done well, it shouldn't really provide a lot more information. So you want to determine what source material, you want what determinations they're going to make, and you want to pay attention to these workloads and, and timelines. You want to make sure that you uh, either make the, the work succinct enough for the reviewers that they can uh, do it on the required timelines, or that you increase the number of reviewers to be able to meet your timelines. But you need to pay attention to their workload. You need to be at pay attention to um, uh, their backup, because they, they can't get a backlog for reviewing these things, because it'll mess up your reporting schedule. So let's talk about uh, coding AEs uh, quickly. And coding AEs is invariably an exercise in, in lumping and splitting, trying to put things that are similar together, uh, but not lump things that are uh, that should be distinguished from each other. And that's always a lot of subjectivity and a lot of uh, clinical judgment. Um, and there's no right answer for, for the way to do that. The way we try to do that uh, systematically is by using uh, uh, controlled vocabularies. So one of the problems with medicine is that there are you know, dozens of terms for every medical condition, and people sometimes use them to mean slight variations and with a certain precision, and sometimes they use them to, mean, to report things that are exactly the same, and sometimes some people do one and some people do the other. So you know, the old Wild West was people just reported things and it was all free text, and there was no controlled vocabulary at all. Um, and then a number of systems were created to prevent that from happening. The most widely used is probably the METRA system, which uh, is sort of an offspring of the International Council on Harmonization. It's run by a nonprofit uh, based out of Europe, and it's got tens of thousands of medical terms and uh, has them established in a hierarchy. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, it's available at uh, very low or free cost to most uh, academic institutions and makes its uh, money to stay alive by charging pharma companies uh, more for its use. I really don't know too much about these other controlled vocabularies. Um, uh, both the WHO ART and the ICD uh, systems really come out of the World Health Organization. Um, and each of these systems has its own special uh, features that make it a little more or less useful for, for certain applications. It's worth briefly noting that ICD-9 and now ICD-10 uh, were never designed for billing purposes. We always think of them as billing codes in the, in the US, but uh, they, were never they were always designed for epidemiology. They were never designed for billing. And ICD-10, which we're just switching to for billing in the United States now, has been had replaced ICD-9 for epidemiology in the World Health Organization uh, a decade ago. Um, so uh, what these controlled uh, vocabularies uh, do is impose a hierarchy, and people report a reported term. So at the bottom of this hierarchy, you can see the reported term, and that's free text. That's whatever free text people report in their uh, adverse event name. And it could be something like sick to stomach. And there are a bunch of computer programs that will uh, read those reported terms and translate them into a lowest level term. Um, and when that can't be done by a computer, then you need to have a human who reads it and finds a lowest level term to, to go with it. So the reported term might be sick to stomach, and a computer would say sick to stomach it means the same thing as feeling queasy. Uh, feeling queasy is, the, the, is something that is known to the system. And it tra translates feeling queasy and a bunch of other lowest level terms to a single preferred term. And the preferred term is, is usually the unit that gets reported uh, most often on lists of aggregated adverse events. Um, and the preferred term may be nausea. And the nausea will link up through a hierarchy to nausea and vomiting symptoms, which is the higher level term, and then a higher level group term, which is GI signs and symptoms. And then that groups to a higher level thing, which is a system organ class, like GI disorders. 
and uh, so the, the the problem is that there's um, the lack of precision with which people use language. There's a lot of terms that can be mapped in very that are similar that get mapped in different ways. There's a lot of multi-axiality within Metro, for example, um, where something could go to a couple of different organ systems. And uh, but if you're not aware of that, then funny things happen. So things like pneumonia, um, as a preferred term, gets grouped up to a system organ class, which is respiratory problems. But pneumonia klebsiella uh, gets mapped up to infectious diseases. Um, and there's which is a different system organ class. So if you're just looking at these system organ class groupings, you can have a problem. Not to mention the problem that you have in that on your list of adverse events, you could have pneumonia, pneumonia klebsiella, pneumonia streptococcus, and they could all, you could have five different terms for pneumonia or 10 different terms for pneumonia that all occur with a 2% incidence and look like they're very uncommon. But if you actually grouped everything together as pneumonia, um, which a lot of clinicians would, would do, you could actually have quite a bit of it. And uh, so it might look like you're hiding or concealing uh, um, uh, things if you, if you go too far. So um, it looks, I, I noticed that I'm running long, so I'm, I'm going to skip through these. There's a number of other problems uh, with coding where things like gold as a uh, uh, name could be mean cold, and cold could mean uh, the viral infection, or cold could mean hypothermia. So a lot of problems with verbatim and judgment uh, need to be used in order to uh, resolve ambiguities in coding systems. Despite all that, coding accuracy and consistency is usually pretty good when, when it's reviewed, but certainly there's a lot of uh, room here for further systemic investigation. Um, Reporting AEs uh, get complicated. Certainly, principal investigators at sites have reporting obligations of site, things that happen uh, at their site uh, to their local IRB, usually on a timely basis. They usually need to repeat, uh, report aggregated uh, stuff just on an annual basis. The investigators need to report to the PI or sponsor of the study. The PI uh, or sponsor needs to report to the FDA and to the DSMB. Um, and, uh, and I said DSMB aggregated reports get reported back to the site to report to the IRB as well. So the reporting structure can get fairly complicated, uh, but everybody just needs to know who they're reporting to. Reporting schedules are usually predefined by the uh, oversight body. So your IRB usually has a bunch of standard reporting schedules, but usually you can create a propose your own reporting schedule as well, uh, as long as everybody agrees on it ahead of time as part of your safety report. Uh, just uh, for future direction, this, this whole notion that everything's a little different everywhere, people know is a problem. There's a big effort to harmonize adverse event reporting on a federal basis, both within the FDA and then within HHS and then uh, transfederally. It hasn't really gotten very far, even though there's a lot of work on it. There are some standard formats that are used mostly for non-investigational purposes, like uh, uh, um, food and uh, um, non-drug uh, regulated substances, um, but the only medical use that's really standardized for this um, uh, safety reporting portal that uh, has been created through uh, HHS is for NIH gene transfer trials. Um, so it's an effort, but it's a slowly moving target. Other elements of safety plan uh, that I won't talk about right now are, are to have a plan for emergency unblinding as part of your safety plan. And uh, with that, I am just at the end. If uh, you give me a second, I'll go back uh, for Dr. Newman Toker's question on the algorithm. If anybody has any other questions, they can type uh, now as well. Oops. Oops. So was your question uh, on this. So, uh, so you're saying, so Dr. Newman Toker wrote, for unlikely, should it be both, but not one or both? Um, so I think if you had another cause possible um, and it was not something the intervention is known to cause, uh, 
then that wouldn't be the same as none related. So I think it could be one or both of those. Doesn't need to have both. And Dr. Moyer is uh, stating that I need to remind you about the evaluations. So there's a link to the evaluation form in the box, and I think I'll let uh, Sam jump in and remind people as well. Yes, um, so if you're interested in CMEs, um, please click Browse to in the Web Links 3 box below, and it'll take you to the evaluation list for all of our webinars, and um, you can leave your thoughts about this, this webinar. It looks like there's a few more questions coming through. I'm sorry I didn't leave more time for questions. Doesn't I don't see that there are any more questions right now. And if there are, uh, I can. We'll, we'll have lots of time to talk next week. Yes, absolutely. And um, if there are more questions, please send, send them to nindes-ctmc-info at umich.edu, and um, we'll get back to you. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, thank you, Dr. Silverlight, for this presentation. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, the next webinar will be on uh, Friday, September 11th at noon, and we'll be talking about the specific AIMS page. So thank you, everyone, and see you in Ann Arbor. <laughs>